Hello everyone, my name is John McDonald. I'm a Nihiloak Métis multidisciplinary artist and author and poet from uh, originally from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. My home communities are the Muskeg Lake Cree Nation and the Mistawasis Nihiloak, all in Treaty 6 territory. I'm very honored to be here today and I was very honored to ask to make this video to share some of my work with you. Um, I know it's kind of an odd way of sharing poetry and sharing the written word and doing storytelling um, one day we will all get together again and get together and listen to each other share each other's words face to face and it'll be a great day when we're able to do that once again uh, I want to showcase in this video some of my lesser known works the poems that you will hear come from my 2017 self-published chapbook entitled dispatches from the front as well, you will hear a poem, Been a Year, which was published by uh, Jack Pine Press in Saskatoon as a limited edition handmade printing. Uh, it was only a run of 50 of this particular little slender book that just contains the one poem. If you are interested in purchasing copies of the chapbook, I will leave um, details at the end of this video. So once again, I'd like to thank... Uh, everyone who is tuning in at this time and i would like to thank the people who are putting on this video and i hope that you enjoy what you're about to hear the 17th of march i wear a black hoodie a flat tweed cap, a pin. The pin is a small copper snake swirled in two S curves, covered in black enamel, reminiscent of Rowan Atkinson of Black Adder. I'll never wear green on the 17th of March. My knowledge of the past prohibits it. How can one revel in alcoholic bliss when one knows of the Celtic pagans burned alive, the potato famine, the coffin ships, the troubles, bloody Sunday, the Easter of 1916? Tattooed upon my arm, the coats of arms, Clan Brady, County Cavan, that accusatory finger pointing at the smiling sun upon a black shield. Black like the snake pin I wear on the 17th of March. Dull thud of a flat tire, the vehicle comes to a stop. The dust from the gravel road catches up with car as the young man opens the driver's door, sits, takes a deep breath, inhaling the dust and wondering if this breath will be among his last because of his brown skin and long hair and the way he's dressed and whether or not the owner of this house will step outside with a rifle because he felt threatened or because that is the story he will tell the cops and if the shots are true there will be no witnesses to contradict it like those people suggested in their online comments the young man's heart begins to thump inside his chest thumping like the flat tire that put him in this situation does he drive on keeping the flat tire thumping keeping his heart thumping Keeping the drum inside the school gymnasium from thumping the way it does when they wheel the casket out towards the hearse? So many thoughts fly through his head as he tries to remember to smile and to be polite and to say, Good afternoon, sir. I'm sorry to bother you, sir. Keeping his hands visible at all times, not looking at the house or the vehicles or the outbuildings too closely or too long making no sudden movements, no threatening gestures, making sure that sir is put at ease so that he doesn't feel that he had to defend himself and his property. The young man's hands tremble 
They shake, and the cold shiver of fear passes over his face and down his back as he thinks of his mother and of his children. He steps out of the vehicle, his feet crunching on the gravel. He looks at his reflection in the door glass to make sure one last time that he doesn't appear too dangerous or frightening. He forces a smile. Being terrified can make you look scary. Wandering the empty halls of my old high school, having those deep introspective thoughts that you're supposed to get from watching a John Hughes film, feeling nostalgic, melancholic, about a place that caused me so much grief to be 15 again. Step lightly upon thin ice, because when you punch through, cold water will grab you, encompass and surround you. When the moment overtakes your senses, try very hard to retain your presence. I am not the vulgar agitator, immature in manner, miscreant I was when I was 20. I've put that all behind me. I didn't win the war. I merely signed an armistice with the enemy. Wounds still open, feel the emotion, flood the holes, soften the ragged sides like sand on the beach. Ancient sepia images, stacks of stiffened Victorian cardboard showing stiffened Victorian faces, unsmiling, stoic, long dead faces of high collared women, Gibson girl aspirations, hair pulled high neath, Victorian millinery at its finest, men about town, starched collars, cuffs, waistcoats, bowlers, boaters, flat caps, top hats, all of them nameless. Lifetimes and stories all lost, save for these boxes of silent cabinet cards, these carts de visite waiting in vain for someone to claim their ancestry. I love that a book can make you cry can make you lament and mourn the death of someone never born, existing only because of the stroke of a pen, the push of a key. The death of an idea upon a page touching deep inside you. One day I shall write something to make you weep. I cut my hair for her. She died, so I cut my hair for her. She was my teenage infatuation. I cut my hair for her. She loved my long hair. She died, so I cut my hair for her. We only kissed once. We were drunk under a streetlight. She died, so I cut my hair for her. It's an old tradition to show absolute mourning. I mourn for her. She died, so I cut my hair for her. It's been a year. My hair has grown back. Not as long as it once was, but it's getting there. Soon there should be enough to braid, to wrap and hide. But not quite yet. She's still dead, the one for whom I shaved my head in grief. Her ashes lie scattered at the bottom 
of a northern Saskatchewan lake.